on this day of remembering and honoring the fallen, uh, please turn to Deuteronomy, way back in the Old Testament, the fifth book of the law, the Torah, Deuteronomy 27. And so today we're going to focus on the protection that God gives us, the hope that we have in him, that he is indeed our refuge. And so we'll be looking at a few passages that, that discuss the remembrance that God had commanded uh, his people, the children of Israel, to have, to always keep him at the forefront, always remember him. They, like us, sometimes wandered and sometimes forgot who God was or forgot what God had done for them. And anytime we forget who God is, life is not going to go well. And so that's why we need to know him, to draw closer to him by reading his word, studying his word, meditating upon it. And so we'll be looking at several passages uh, in Deuteronomy and elsewhere in our study this morning. So before we continue, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll move from, on from there. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you humbled by your might, by your power, humbled by the love, the unconditional love that you show us, the many blessings that you shower us with. On this day of remembrance, on this day of remembering those who have fallen, those who have given the ultimate sacrifice for freedom in this country and elsewhere, we also recognize the freedom that we have from sin because of the sacrifice that your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, unselfishly made on the cross. Help us to focus on you, that you are a God of refuge, you are a God of strength, you are a God who disciplines his children when they have wandered astray, and a God of comfort who welcomes them back with mercy and forgiveness. Be with us this morning as we honor you and learn from your word. In your son's name we pray, amen. All right, so Deuteronomy chapter 27. Now, if you recall, Deuteronomy is uh, kind of a retelling of the law. The book of Exodus, the children of Israel needed to know what the law was. Uh, they knew it, but um, sometimes we need things in writing. So we get the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, as it's sometimes referred to. And those aren't the only commands, but you think about it, all ten of the Ten Commands, uh, they cover every aspect of obedience to the Lord. Um, by the way, uh, in Protestant circles, we have them numbered the way that we do, but not everybody does. So uh, we won't get into that so much today. But um, And so in Deuteronomy, the children of Israel are ready to get into the promised land, and they're going to be surrounded by a lot of people who did not serve the Lord, did not serve the God of the Bible, Yahweh, and they're, they maybe forgot things after a few years of wandering around in the wilderness. Um, some of us don't remember what we ate for breakfast this morning, and so this is an important reminder to the children of Israel. It's like, if you're confused about what I expect of you, here's what I expect of you and from you. So now we look at Deuteronomy 27. So verses 1, starting verse 1. Now Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep the whole commandment that I command you today. And on the day you cross over the Jordan to the land that you, the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster, and you shall write on them all the words of this law when you cross over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. And when you have crossed over the Jordan, you shall set up these stones concerning which I command you today on Mount Ebal, and you shall plaster them with plaster. So it's not maybe the most exciting passage in Scripture, uh, but God wants them to erect these monuments to remember what? What does he want them to remember? 
His commandments, yeah. What else does he want them to remember? His promises, absolutely. He wants them to remember those things. He wants them to remember, uh, yeah, James? that he has kept his promises. Remember, we're commanded to be holy because God is holy, and he expects us to be obedient, he expects us to emulate his uh, qualities, if you will. We do that so imperfectly, um, and that's where God's grace and mercy comes in, so we're thankful for that. So, he says, okay, keep these commandments, and to serve as a reminder, build these monuments, uh, these stones of remembrance, if you will, so that you know what's going on. And he tells them, uh, verse 2, And on the day you cross over the Jordan to the land that the Lord God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster. And so even in his command, he's reminding them of his faithfulness to them through the, uh, through the wilderness and what he did for them, that he was a God who did keep his promises, that he never, he never wandered away from the truth, even if they had wandered literally and figuratively uh, for a generation. So they set up, they're commanded to set up these things. In verse 5 we continue, And there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall wield no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones, and you shall offer burnt sacrifices on it to the Lord your God. And you shall sacrifice peace offerings and shall eat there, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. And you shall write on the stones all the words of this law very plainly. So nothing, no frills. Uh, note that they were supposed to assemble this altar. What was unique about the stones that they used to build this altar? Yeah, Judy? They were uncut. They weren't supposed to use any tools on those stones. Why do you think that is? What, why might that be the case? Yeah, man's work versus God's work. It's like, look, I already provided the, and don't you, isn't that cool? This is our God. In eternity past, before he created the earth and those stones that would be there, he already knew, he already had a selection of perfect stones for that altar. That's, we have a God of detail, a God who cares about the big things, but cares about the little things. And so even down to the stones, he provided those very rocks at, at some point. Well, we know what point. Eternity passed. That's a long time ago. It's like forever. And it says, you shall write on the stones all the words of this law plainly. So stones that God had provided, they were supposed to write the law which he had also provided. Now, God seems to tell us to not do a lot of things, and he also tells us to do a lot of things. And maybe we don't like that. How many of you love to be told what to do? Uh, how many of you are firstborn children? Ooh, wow. Most of the firstborn are on the right side. That makes sense. <laughs> My right. Uh, so firstborn, I'm a firstborn. Um, firstborns tend to be a little bossy if there's younger siblings. Alex, wow, that's the most passionate response I've seen from you in church. <laughs> and you are number three in the pack? Okay. But you're the oldest son, so does that give you any special privileges? Good, okay. <laughs> Not at all. So firstborns, we tend to be a little bit, uh, kind of, maybe, I don't want to use the word control freak, yeah? Now, I thought I was just doing my mom and dad a favor when I would discipline my younger brother for them, right? I'm helping them out. They didn't see it that way. <laughs> and so they came up with an ingenious scheme. If I disciplined my brother for something that he had done, not allowing them to be the parent, I would get the punishment he would have received. That doesn't seem fair. 
it kind of, it did help a bit. I just, I just felt I was a servant of the Lord and carrying out justice and wrath. But that's not what God was talking about here. You shall write on the stones all the words of this law very plainly. They were to remember what God's law was. Now, it's one thing to remember it. What's the really difficult part? Doing it, applying it. Let's go back a few, quite a few chapters toward the beginning of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now, does anyone know, in fact, I know some of you do, what's in Deuteronomy chapter 5? Yes, James. The reiteration of the Ten Commandments. The reiteration of the Ten Commandments. Uh, so that is, there's our context here where now we're leading into chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. Do you notice how many times the word Lord and Lord our God appears? Uh, why would that language be in there, do you think? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> it shows, well, there, there's no mistaking who is speaking, that it's not just Moses' opinion or somebody else's, someone else's opinion. This is the Lord our God. And again, as we've commented before, the word Lord in the English, we indicate this in all caps, and that tells us that in the Hebrew it is Yahweh. Um, and so we have the Lord our God. This is God in, in everything that he encompasses, God in all of his attributes, his might, his character, uh, all of his characters, characteristics rather. So hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Well, that sounds familiar. There's this guy that lived, oh, a couple thousand years ago, and he quoted from this passage. And of course, we know this as the great command um, that we see when Jesus is asked, Rabbi, teacher, what is the great command? And he responds, quoting Deuteronomy here, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And then he quotes from Leviticus, and he says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 6, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Was God being literal or figurative here, or both? Both, you know, so there's the, I think he was literally telling them, it's like, look, your, your house physically should point to, point to the Lord. Everything about it. Let's say the rapture happened right now. Woohoo! <laughs> and we're out of here, right? When people start rifling through your stuff and they go into your apartment or your, or your, your penthouse or your home, what are they going to know about you? What memorial stones do you have set up in your house? What's written on your do doorposts? Are they going to know who you were in Christ? Are they going to know that you were a Christian? I don't know. Now, some of people, and I'm not being judgmental here, but if a stranger walked into your home, they might think that you belong on an episode of Hoarders. Did anybody want to confess to that? Okay, one person did. Thank you. I appreciate your honesty there. But you see what I'm saying, and I forget this myself. Our, our very homes are a testament to who God is. So because God is a God of order, maybe our house should be a house of order? Nah. <laughs> and the more kids you have, the, 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 the just, that just goes out the door, doesn't it? Actually, you should, then your kids should be cleaning the house. 
That's Alex. That is straight from the. It's straight from God's word. I, that's my interpretation. If you read it in the message, it says, "Clean your house for your mother, because you love her and you love God." Actually, that's not far from the truth, is it? So I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad about their horrible housekeeping skills. <laughs> I kind of have a, a built-in accountability on keeping my house clean, and that is uh, I get, because of the building that I live in, I get regular inspections. So there's a bed bug detecting dog. Her name is Sandy, but you're not allowed to touch the dog or anything. I know that would just be torture for some of you. But uh, yeah, it detects bed bugs. And uh, so they come in uh, twice a year, so every six months. And then the, uh, organ the agency that runs the building, they come in uh, periodically and do an inspection. We should kind of have that same mentality in our own lives, is that we should, our lives should be continually clean and tidied up because the Lord is looking at us and looking at our hearts constantly. But how many of our hearts need an intervention? However you want to define that. So, um, teach them diligently to your children. That is the primary responsibility, one of the primary responsibilities of a parent is to teach their kids who God is, what he's done for them, and who the Messiah is. Who is Jesus? Now, um, I'll throw this out to you. How do you, do, and you don't have to be a parent to do this, because some of you work with kids here with our Awana program, um, or in a Christian school, for example. How do you share Jesus with kids? What are some ways that you can do that in the home specifically, but um, what are some thoughts there? by your life, well, that's huge. How many of you had parents, or as a parent, have uttered the words, do as I say, not as I do? That happened often with my dad when he was driving. I'm just, you fill in the blanks. All right, so through your life, what are some other ways that you can get God's word into your kids, expose them to it, expose them to who God is? Yeah, Reagan. So, we actually have to spend time together. Ooh, yeah, spend time together. I know. It's not fun, Alex says. You will cherish those times at some point, Alex. <laughs> so, uh, to summarize for the folks over there, um, communication, talking with your kids. I remember, I think it was James Dobson who talked about one of the, one of the things that's missing from our families today is the dinner table. Have meals with your kids because that's when those conversations just can naturally, hey, how was your day? Ask your kids questions and don't accept, you know, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Be very specific. We all know the difference between open-ended questions and closed-ended questions. So a closed-ended question can be answered with yes or no. Open-ended. So instead of saying, uh, did you have a good day at school, Alex? Well, that's a yes or no. Um, say, you know, what, what happened today in school that you found interesting or what conflict came up or what's, a real, what's something you can celebrate that, you th you know, that was really awesome in school? You know, just ask those. They don't have, you don't have to be fancy. You don't have to be eloquent. Just ask. Talk. 
I, I think many times bad communication is better than no communication. So say something. You're going to mess up. Any other thoughts on, yeah, Kathy? Well, <clears throat> praying together and studying God's Word together. Absolutely. Praying together. Have devotionals with your kids. Um, I talked about, I shared a little bit from, uh, let's see, two years ago, two and a half years ago, when I was at the pastor's conference for Answers in Genesis, um, they had a speaker. Here's the crazy thing. He was my least favorite speaker by far of all the speakers there. And yet, one of the segments he spoke on, and he was given an extra segment <laughs> because one of the speakers had to cancel at the last minute, but he talked about having family devotions and family worship. Again, it doesn't have to be fancy, uh, but read scripture together, read a daily devotional. If snag in our daily bread on the way out, do that, do something, um, because the, the relationships that that builds, plus what kind of message does it send to your kids if you do those types of things? Yeah. God's that God's word is important. That God is important. Um, that's why with my parents, we didn't, we didn't have a conversation on Sunday morning as to whether we were going to church or not. We just went to church. It, develop a Christ-centered culture in your home, whether you have kids or not. Sometimes kids can be a great motivator uh, because they'll, they'll kind of call you on the carpet when you're not doing what you're supposed to do and they'll say, hey, why aren't we going to church? Those are annoying kids, so send them off to Angola or somewhere. No, that's horrible. Don't do that. Um, but developing this, this culture where it's just part of who you are as a family. Um, they may rebel against that, um, but yeah, James? I care enough about you to spend time with you. Well, thank you, James. I appreciate that. <laughs> James said, I care enough about you to spend time with you. Is that what you said? Yeah, and that's your, isn't that true? That's what you're telling your kids. If you're too busy for your kids all the time, they, they can sense that. Yeah. Um, I think even when they're babies, when you can do that, like I sing songs to Elias, he may not like my singing voice, but he has no choice. Um, <laughs> but I sing him, you know, worship songs for children. Yeah. We don't know that, and I, 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 that, that's a great suggestion about still, even with, your, even with babies, singing to them. Have them, you know, well, you may have them, uh, like if you're doing your daily devotional and you've got your, your child with you, read it out loud. We, I think we underestimate how much information they're taking in. Um, when we taught, uh, years ago I taught anger management here, and one of the things we talked about is the limbic system. It's that really, if this is your brain, then right in the middle of your brain is a small little tiny part called the limbic system, and it, it's very crude. It's just, it basically records information. Yes, no, good, bad, safe, unsafe. That's all it does. It doesn't have a time element to it. In other words, it does not know whether, when it records an unsafe thing, uh, it doesn't know whether you were two months or 20 years old. It has no, it just knows when I hear or feel this, then I, here's how I react. And we tend to react with fight, flight, or freeze. We numb ourselves. Um, and so we don't know what our kids are taking in, but they're, re they're taking everything in. We just don't, you know, how does it compute? I don't know, but it's there. All right, well, enough of that. Any other comments? All right. So you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. They were being very literal where you were, you know, tying something to your forehead and these little stone pieces would bang you in the head. Well, it was a reminder. Has anyone ever tried to break a habit and you do the rubber band trick? You snap the rubber band every time you feel like you want to punch somebody? No? I'm the only one? Okay. Um, of course, you could take the rubber band off and shoot that at the person and that would be wrong. Don't do that but serves as a reminder, a reminder of, 
of, uh, of God's word. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So not only were you reminded of who God was to you and his law, but your neighbors knew who he was to you. And I'm not saying you need to put a big I heart Jesus sign out on your lawn or, or mow the 23rd Psalm into your lawn. That would, be, that would be clever. Maybe try doing that, no? And when we move down in Deuteronomy chapter six, for the sake of time, we'll skip down to verse 20. So when your son or daughter asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? So that question, the kids will start asking questions. Make sure you have answers. And if you've developed this Christ-centered culture, then some of that's going to already, it's kind of built in, uh, in a way. Um, Skipping down to verse 24, and the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. So, remembering God, his goodness, his greatness. There's a blessing in it. Notice in, uh, in verse 25 there, and it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do the, these things. There's consequences to every decision we make in life. Good consequences, blessing. Bad consequences, discipline. And we also can be a blessing by association. If we're following God and serving God as head of our households, as a Sunday school teacher, as a Christian school teacher, as somebody who flips burgers at McDonald's, whatever, you know, the vocation the Lord has called you to, if we're serving the Lord, then it has a positive impact on those around us. Uh, I mean, how many of you have had situations at work uh, where somebody may not know that you're a Christian, but they ask you, it's like, what's different about you? I remember years ago, uh, I was working at an architectural firm, downtown Seattle, and someone said, he, this guy, he said, I noticed you don't, you never swear. So even that was, part of a testimony. There were times where I wanted to swear. Working with architects was not always fun because it was a lot of high stress and multi-million, sometimes billion dollar deals that were on the line. And I only knew there were 260, give or take, folks in our office at any given time on staff. And I only knew of two other Christians in the entire firm. So it was not a very godly environment. It was a little shocking to me how, you know, I won't go into all the details, but um, so to, to be a light was not always comfortable or easy, um, but yet just a small thing like not using profanity got noticed. And that gave me an opportunity to talk about my faith and not from a you know, self-righteous you know, standpoint of, well, look at how awesome I am. Thank you for noticing my awesomeness, which I think I actually did have a t-shirt that said that once. Anyway, so I'm sure many of you have experienced similar situations where people notice that you're different when bad things happen, how do you react? Do you completely lose it? Or do you have that confidence, that peace? We don't necessarily, we're not always settled inside uh, completely, but we know that we know that we know that we have a God who cares and a God who's got it all worked out for us. So there's this beautiful blessing uh, that is there. So what happens if we don't serve the Lord? Well, we've read this passage many times in the book of Judges. So Judges chapter 2, verse 10. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who, and notice the two things, and we just mentioned this a couple weeks ago here, did not know the Lord 
or the work that he had done for Israel. So they didn't know who he was. They did not know that he was a God of compassion, a God of love, a God of wrath <laughs> when we stray, a God of discipline, but that's, out of his, that's born out of his love for us. If you love your kids, you're not going to let them do something stupid or unsafe. Well, sometimes you're going to let them do things that are stupid because that's the only way they learn. Um, thanks, Mom and Dad. Actually, I am thankful for that because that has to be one of the hardest things as a parent is letting your kids fail, knowing they're going to fall flat on their face, but you have to let them sometimes or they're not going to learn. So all that generation also were gathered to their father. So they didn't know, did not know who the Lord was and they, they didn't know what he had done for them. That just seems crazy to me. So the, this generation had dealt with the wanderings, you know, in the wilderness, and they had seen God save them time after time after time. And their parents and their grandparents, and think of the, the descendants that is like, oh yeah, your great-grandfather crossed the Red Sea, God split it and spared them. And, but they weren't telling their kids that anymore. They forgot who he was. Now, the next verse, not surprisingly, um, it didn't cause any problems at all. Okay, it might have caused one or two problems. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. What an affront to a holy God that the, the very God that had saved them, that had performed miraculous works in their very presence, who had kept them alive, sustained them those many years, and they, what do they do? I don't know if they pulled out the Ten Commandments and it's like, well, let's start at the top. And they start serving Baal. They abandoned, verse 12, the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now, we can be, and, and we know, you see these ver that phrase there, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. If you've read through the book of Judges, you see it show up repeatedly in the first several chapters, and that's why God brought, you know, these judges forth that would, you know, call them on their mess and, and say, look, you guys have disobeyed the Lord, and because of that, this is what's going to be, happen. There's going to be discipline. There's going to be a negative consequence uh, to your behavior. So I don't know what they had done with those stones. Did they ignore them? Did they paint over them? Did they dismantle the altars? Now if we fast forward to 1 Peter, the New Testament, we have some more rock talk here. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Although, I appear to be missing a slide here, so I'm going to go ahead and turn there. So 1 Peter chapter 2, way at the end of your Bible. If you hit Revelation, you've gone too far, just back up a few. You should be good. Get through the three letters to John. So 1 Peter chapter 2, <clears throat> excuse me. Verse 4, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So, sorry about the missing few words there at the end there, but, um, but now you see that there is a, another reference to a stone, this time that we are to be like living stones. And of course, we know that the stone, the rock, is our Lord Jesus Christ. But note what Paul says to the church in Corinth. So in 2 Corinthians, 
So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you know that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. And so we see this, this shift here of how it's not about having a, um, yes, the Ten Commandments were etched in stone and, and that was a very physical thing and that's fine, um, but because of Jesus Christ, because of the coming of the Messiah, now it's not, the law is not written on tablets of stone, it's written on something different. It's written on us. In fact, in the Greek, it's, uh, if we go back to verse three, where it says, uh, written not with ink, but with this, uh, oh, sorry, verse two. Uh, you yourselves are, are, boy, it's hard to say, are our, to get right after one another. You ourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our, and in the Greek, it's, it would say fleshly hearts or human hearts. Um, to be known and read by all. Now, how do people read what's written on our hearts? Pardon? Memorization. Okay, we memorize this word that gets it on our heart, in our heart. How do people, other folks, see that? How we live. How we, back to how we live, right? So, it's great if you want to have a t-shirt that says, I love Jesus. What's more powerful is live for Jesus so that people can see his love and see who he is through you. So, the latter part of verse three, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Stone is not a living thing. There's no life in a stone. Um, and yet our hearts are living, breathing, pumping organs. Not breathing literally, but they do produce oxygen. Um, so not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So all of the law that God had given, let's just take the Ten Commandments, uh, for example, because it's a summation of the law. And that's one reason that Jesus sums up the Ten with, you could argue, with one word, love. Now, not in some weird way that we see some folks talk about uh, in our current culture, but you think about it, all ten, all 10 of the commandments, because we've talked about this many times before, so you've got the 10. The first four have to do with what? God, our relationship with him. And they all have to do with love. If you love God, you will not worship other gods. You will not make idols. You will not take his name in vain. You will not, uh, or you will, on the positive side, you will honor him, you know, with the Sabbath. And then the final six have to do with our relationship with one another. Based on our love for him, because we are created in his image. We are his children. He wants us to respect his creation, whether it's people, whether it's the planet, whatever it is, good stewardship. And so those final six, if I love Dina, and I do, I'm not going to lie to her. If I love Judy, and I do, probably not going to murder her. I mean, that would be a really awkward Valentine's gift. <laughs> be mine. We we we. Don't recommend it. Makes sense. So what does Jesus do? He takes the ten and he narrows them down to three: love God, love others, love yourself. And they they they're intertwined. I cannot love Tony Hartford properly if I don't love God, right? because then I'm, I'm not in line with what God wants for me. And I really, I can't love Tony if I don't love myself. You, sometimes we forget that. I, I catch myself every, every once in a while, you know, kind of that self-loathing. It's like, oh man, I hate myself for fill in the blank, you know? But God doesn't want us to hate ourselves either. It's just as much of a sin to hate yourself as it is to hate someone else. Now, we all know it's wrong to hate God, but if I hate, if I hate Madeline, and I don't, then I'm not, I can't love God properly. So it all ties in. Love God, love others, love yourself. 
Now, some people have changed the God to Jesus because then it spells out joy, Jesus, others, you. That's fine. That works. Jesus is God. Uh, and joy sounds much better than goy. Doesn't it? You could sing, I got that goy, 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 goy down in my heart. Where? Down in... No? How many of you have never heard that Sunday school song? All right. Tablets of stone. <laughs> so now we've got tablets on the heart. So the law, there we go, that's where I was going. That's where that rabbit went. The Ten Commandments. When Jesus came, what did he do with the Ten Commandments? Did he get rid of them? Uh-uh, what did he do? He fulfilled them. He's like, I'm here to fulfill the law, not to eliminate it, because he repeats almost verbatim nine out of the ten. The Sabbath one, a little bit different. Um, but uh, discussion for another day. So he doesn't eliminate them. He says that, okay, it's no longer just on tablets. It's not over you. It's now in you. It's written on your heart. Now, some of you belong to the Zipper Club. You've had open heart surgery. I know Lonnie and we, we, go, we have a group, a couple of other, the rest of you. When they did open heart surgery, I don't think they saw the Ten Commandments written on my heart. We were all shocked that. Thank you, that I had a heart. Appreciate it. See, I knew that was there. And I still love Kathy Dugan. She's my favorite Irish attorney. <laughs> oh, mercy. And yet, isn't that amazing what God did? So the, the law is not over us any longer. And we can, if we say, okay, we're not under law, but we're under grace, some people get the misconception that we can then do whatever we want. No. <laughs> is that in God's grace, the law is not over us, but it's now in us. So it is our responsibility, personal responsibility, which I think is one thing that's missing in our culture today. Personal responsibility. Be responsible for your actions. And be responsible for what you do when somebody else is a doo-doo muffin to you. Because people are going to be, they're going to treat you wrongly, unfairly. They're going to be nasty to you. They're going to treat you uh, based on immutable characteristics that should have nothing to do with have nothing to do with your value or your worth in God's eyes. So we can whine about it, or we can respond with God's qualities and His characteristics. Because personal responsibility, you know, it's like own your mess. God's all about personal responsibility. Remember in the beginning uh, in Genesis. He gives Adam and Eve the opportunity to own their mess, and instead they play the blame game. Oh, well, that woman you gave me, and Eve's like, well, it's the serpent. They blame, rather than own their mess, they blame someone else. And it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like the blame apple fell far from the tree because Cain, when he's confronted, he doesn't take responsibility either. So. But none of you have that problem, so I will move on. So kind of in, in the last several minutes that we have here this morning, I want to look to one last passage of Scripture, Psalm 90. Psalm 90, or the 90th Psalm, if you'd rather. Uh, you may know the answer to this question, but there's something really unique about this particular psalm. Um, there's a couple of unique things, but one has to do with authorship. Who wrote Psalm 90? Yeah. In fact, there's the superscription. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Listen to what he has to say about who God is. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past or as a watch in the night. 
You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. It's a beautiful response to what Moses had experienced in the wilderness, what he had seen in his life. He alludes to you know, the Egyptians being wiped out, you know, in the Red Sea and, and, and how God was ever faithful to him and how we should ask him to guide our steps. I'm not going to take the time uh, uh, to, but to do this. I was going to have you guys, uh, mm, yeah, we could do that. We've got time to answer this question. So Carl's got the mic, the handheld, but very shortly in a sentence or two, I know that can be difficult, uh, but how has God been faithful to you? So if you'd like to share, we'll take a few uh, uh, opportunities there. So shoot up your hand, Carl will run the mic to you. But how has God been faithful to you? And if no one raises their hands, then I'm going to start from the beginning of the message. Carl. the prospect of several months with no income and uh, through the faithfulness of God's people uh, we made it through in great financial shape yeah. uh, God's been very faithful awesome thank you uh, Marcy you're going to make poor Carl go all the way across thank you for doing that I'll give you the five bucks later appreciate that by 12 right um in just raising on him, there were some many, many scary times, and um, it, I know it was by God's grace. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. A couple more? Yeah, Judy. God's been faithful to me because I was raised by a godly mother who made sure I learned God's word. And in college, I found a good teaching pastor. And coming over here, I found yet another one. So that's been God's faithfulness. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Uh, Madeline and then Kathy. So I was blind, and now I can see. Mm. Amen. That's awesome. Kathy and then uh, Reagan. Uh, he's never given up on me every time I mess up, which is frequently. <laughs> uh, I, I hear you there. Thank you. And Reagan. Despite myself and despite my sins and failures, God has always proven that he keeps his promises and led my family to a safe place. Awesome. Thank you. So these are good things to be mindful of and you know, as we're remembering the men and women who gave their lives for our country, for our freedom, we don't want to forget God's faithfulness to us. We are free as a nation because of God and his graciousness. And if, another question you can answer on your own, you know, what will your legacy be? What will your children remember about you? Um, yeah, they're going to remember some of the bad things, but what are the things... If all they remember is that, yeah, mom, dad, they weren't perfect, but they always went back to the Lord. They always stayed, you know, true to him. Uh, that's an amazing legacy. So as we wrap up this portion of our service, um, 
we're going to show a video. And uh, this is actually at the beginning, you'll hear um, President Ronald Reagan giving one of his speeches. And uh, there's, uh, I think it gives the credits up front, but uh, at the front, but uh, this is the Hillsdale College, this is their choir um, singing in the background. So go ahead and start that, Marty, when you are ready. We are a nation under God, and I believe God intended for us to be free. close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the freedom that we have in this country. We know that we're not a perfect nation. We pray for revival, Lord, that this nation would turn back to biblical principles, that they would recognize who you are. We've wandered away from you just as the children of Israel did, and we have forgotten who you are and what you've done for us. May we never take for granted the freedoms that we have. May we never take for granted the eternal life that we have because of the sacrifice of your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Be with us this Memorial Day weekend as we do remember the men and women who have sacrificed their lives for ours. And help us also to remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. We thank you, we praise you in his holy name, amen.